What it do, people? What it do? It is Friday, and you know how we do on Friday. We get our talk in between our talk on your way to the to the club, from home, from work. However, COVID got you doing your stuff today. We are live on Friday night. I was having some technical difficulties, but we got it all now. I think we're ready to roll. So, you know how we do. It is, well, we got two weeks to the election. The final debate was on last night. We are rocking with that. Let me know if you if you saw it, how it was, what you thought about it, how you feeling about the election. Make sure you uh, like my page, my elected official Antoine Brown page, and make sure you go like my YouTube page. YouTube page need to get some traction. So come on, people. Let's go. Go like my YouTube page at Antoine C. Brown and like that page so we can get this up so we can have more discussions. I feel like I'm going to be a YouTube star now that we do this every Friday night and we get these conversations going. So today's show, we're going to have uh, two good people. We had a, a show with uh, some DSW and some doctoral candidates and some powerful women about two weeks ago and we had some discussion and I thought, hey, I got a whole uh, another crew that I like that they always uh, been supporting me over the last seven months, eight months, we're doing nine months now to this program. And why not have them on to have a little discussion? If you have not got your mail-in ballot, it is now too late. So let's be prepared to stand in long lines and get out and vote. It's going to be volunteers out there helping with food. It's going to be people out there helping if you got to go to the bathroom. So tell somebody, hold your spot, bring a chair, bring some snacks. You got early voting starting on the 27th, which is next week. So make sure you get out and do that. But I know we got our people in the waiting room. So let's see how we're going to be able to, let's see how we should start this. I think Jamie's there. And I know Jamie can't turn on her on her camera today, but I know she can talk to me. So, Jamie, how are you, Jamie? Good. How are you? I can't complain. I'm sorry that people can't see that beautiful face, but I understand. <laughs> Hope all is well. So, Jamie, everybody that joins my show has to tell the people how they met me, and they got to say something good about me, nothing mean. All right? <laughs> okay. All right. Go for it, Jamie. So we met in our in our first term in the DSW program at USC, and there's a lot of positive things to say. I would say one of my favorite things about you is that you're very welcoming of people. You're very accepting of people, and you're so that's more than one. But and you really listen to people. I think you take the time to listen to people's ideas and I can see you processing information. You know, it's not a quick jump to judgment. You know, you're really trying to receive what someone has to say. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. That was that was extra nice. That was more than one, but I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> hey, oh, Jamie. Then I, well, then I got to add, I also really, really, really like your wife, too. So. Oh, no, Jesus. Everybody likes Felicia. That's not fair. That's not fair. Everybody likes Felicia. So outside of Jamie being a Cowboys fan, I like her too. Other than that, you know, this NFC East is the horrible part. But we'll talk about football a little later, Jamie. Wow. We're going to bring on our other classmate and our good friend, the Miss Leslie. How are you? How are you, Leslie? Hello. I'm well. How are you? I am good. And everything. I see you moving around. Thank, yes, okay, thank you for grocery shopping. Oh, that's right. That's all right. We can do this while you grocery shop. You do your thing. So, like I just did with Jamie, you have to tell the people how you know me and say one good thing about me, nothing bad. Ooh, no, I'm just kidding. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie. Is that me? Yeah. I'm 
Ooh, Leslie, your Leslie, Jamie, it's me and you because Leslie's connection was a little bad. I don't know where it is in that grocery store. What's she doing? Yeah, I she might be in Costco. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looked like. It's too much food around her. So that's going on. So Jamie, Jamie, first let's start with football. Why your why your uh cowboys look so bad? First of all, I my children are fourth generation fans. Okay, so we're talking about legacy here. So, you know, we are really sad about Dak, but the backup, he has experience, you know, as being a starting quarterback. So I don't feel like our season is done, but it's, you know, we taking some losses right now. Mm, okay. He's spoken like a true Dallas Cowboy fan. Well, why would you <laughs> take your kids through that pain and misery? That's okay. <laughs> it is okay. But I understand. So, Jamie, um, I know a lot about you. So we've been over the time. I know about your husband and the kids, and you're doing great work. You want to tell people about your DSW project and how, you know, what you got going on and talk about that a little bit? Okay. So my uh, project is really looking at safe parking programs for those that have lost their home but are living in vehicles. And so for some people, that's kind of like a new concept to hear about because when we think about homelessness and we think about options for people, we think of normally shelters, transitional shelters. But number one, you know, if you really look at it, it's, it's sometimes very difficult to get into shelters. There's, you know, wait lists because there are there are not beds to accommodate everybody. And then secondly, if you just put yourself in the shoes of somebody who has lost their home, maybe they have children, and you think about the idea of maybe going into a space like a shelter where there are so many strangers, you know, it could be something like very uncomfortable. So on the West Coast, safe parking concepts are very popular because it's to accommodate you know uh, accommodate those that are experiencing vehicular homelessness and for whatever reason whether it be personal reasons or you know lack of space they just aren't seeking uh you know to to use shelter space so what my project is trying to do is i'm working with our city's local safe parking program to kind of expand their investor team. So to really look at engaging the community to being more receptive, you know, looking at organizations that if in any way can help or contribute to expanding the, the program, because currently the lot can only house or, you know, hold about 15 cars. But if we could garner more support for expansion, you know, you think about 15 cars a night, you know, there are some lots that can hold up to 70 cars per night. And at that size, you can even host RVs because, you know, that is something as well. We see uh, people who have lost their homes that sometimes have to reside in, you know, um, in RVs. So just, it's you know, it's really looking outside of the box at how do we assist people in intermediate uh housing needs. So, you know, we know the big goal is we need more affordable housing, but in the meantime, before we get there, how can we accommodate, you know, people and make it, you know, give people options, you know, you know, have a little, you know, sleeping in your car, that's nobody's ideal thing to do, but just having that option of knowing, okay, I have these different, um, you know, different spaces or, different um, programs that I can choose from to kind of help build myself back up, you know, that's really the strength of the program and what it's trying to do. And every time I hear it is your, your program is going to be a national program. It's not, I know you focusing on Long Beach right now, but it's going to be a national program because we dealing with the same issues in Maryland. We have a great, uh, we, the social, the service department, the health and human services department here does a great job with it. But I know for a fact that what you're doing and, and the progress you want to make on this thing, I'm going to be able to call you and be like, hey, Jamie, come on over to Maryland and show them how to do it. I can give so, you cash if you want cash outside. I'll be, I'll be uh, on it. And Leslie's still in the, in the grocery store. So. 
Let's we got Leslie back. Hey Leslie, how are you again? Hi. So, I'm well. so how are you? Good. I had asked Jamie to tell uh the people about her her capstone project, and I'm gonna do the same thing with you. Tell a little about your capstone project. And you, I'm going to talk about your background a little bit because I love your background in this. So go ahead and tell the people about what you're doing and how you're going to save the world. Oh, Jesus. So you're going to tell my background or you want me to tell my background? You can tell your background, but we're going to discuss it a little later. Okay. So hello, everyone. I am Leslie. As previously stated, a um, little bit of background. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have experience working with prison reentry as well as um, sex worker diversion programs, trauma informed care, domestic violence victims, um, homeless families, substance abuse, and much more. Um, so, Capstone Project, anything about sex work, that's my alley. Um, so, I'm really looking to develop a, um, I'm going to speak it into existence, a nationally recognized police curriculum which addresses um, law enforcement best practices for all of those who engage in um, all of those within the sex industry. So right now the United States has um, been putting a lot of emphasis on trafficking victims, but they've left out um, sex workers who are formerly known as prostitutes. I hate that term, it's very degrading um, and dehumanizing. Um, so all of those within the sex industry for best practices. So I'm looking to address empathy, trauma-informed care, um, human rights, actually confront profiling, biases, unjust practices um, within law enforcement, as well as um, connect the dots between police officers and law enforcement, not knowing what community resources are out there to really assist um, one of the world's most vulnerable populations. Um, so that is my capstone project. And to top it off, we're going to switch gears and change some things, shake up some social norms, and actually have um, those who um, have previously worked in the sex industry actually co-facilitate those trainings alongside with law enforcement and community um, organizers um, so that, once again, um, nothing about those in the sex industry will be discussed without them being present and actually shaping um, creating change and um, the movement around their lives. There you yeah. go. And every time I know we, we had a lot of discussions since January about, you know, the ups and downs of you going into that population, because I know it's not a thing to do. And I know, you know, but every time I sit down and talk to you about it, you, you, you your knowledge about how to make this a, a change and for this population is wonderful. And I'm sure once you get your curriculum national you know, and everything is going great, we'll be able to say, hey, I remember when Leslie was was almost in tears that first week of class because she didn't know if they were going to accept this. Yeah, going to accept this as a capstone presentation. But, but ladies, hey, we are less than a month away from defending our capstones. And if all is well, we will be candidates in, in in uh in november so as all y'all know my capstone project is uh i switched it up a lot it started off to be uh fatherhood my my capstone problem was uh let's see i forgot what the definition was was uh if fathers are not in the home does that affect the behavioral health problems of black men then it kind of shift i kind of went to all uh, right, they kind of went to okay, the, all the behavioral health problems that's happening within our communities do that affect the dropout rate and how we, you know, we function in schools because that was something special. So I created a, pro, a program, or it was a program, a program was golf exposure, getting mental health, having counselors with them, and then it wasn't in my heart. So my heart led me back to how do I get more men. African American men to college. How do I get them through college, and how do I get them to have less student loan debt or be debt free when they graduate? So as I was working through that problem, I came up with okay, it's the student loan crises and how we are not as African American people in the whole, but I'm concentrating on the men section is how we are not able to get out of 
get out, get out college degree, get high paying jobs and start creating wealth because we had so much student loan debt because of the circumstances we did to, to even get what they told us was uh, the right thing to do within it with a college degree. So we're working on that. I'm still, we, all of us, and I thank these ladies so much have a paper due tonight. So they took time. They took time to come on with me and talk about the paper. And I know it's giving us some slack, but this is good practice. And Jamie, I'm going to ask you a question right quick, because I know you don't like this part of uh, what we're doing in this semester in public discourse. So I'm I'm really mad that we can't see your face so you can uh, work on these things. But we, we'll, we'll get you on another time when you're at home and not where you are right now. So how do you feel with this, Jamie? Are you comfortable right now? Everything okay? Yes. This is a yes. new experience, but I feel you're making it a very welcoming, comfortable experience. That's that's good because that's all this is. And when we discuss public discourse and how we discuss and the things that we got going on, it should be like this because you are, as you expressed earlier, your real knowledge and what what your capstone and what your passions want to be. So, if anybody told you this week, we proud of you and thank you for sharing. Yes, keep up the great work. So, same thing with you, last night. How you feel right now? And I know you, you're a little more. Uh, you got a little more personality. Jamie likes to be laid back a little bit, but you, I know you, you don't like doing this, but you are meant for the camera. And I tell you that all the time. So how you feel right now? Everything good? I feel like the Lord is giving me some signs. I like this. Okay. All right. I that's like good. This. Did you get me some salmon out of Costco's? Well, we're at BJ's today. Oh yeah. BJ's. Okay. All right. I got some water. Oh, oh, okay. Water is always good. So you gotta stay okay. hydrated and so care for this paper. Yeah, of course. I'm gonna need some of that. So let me ask you. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about the two weeks ago when I had an all female uh, PhD doctoral candidates on this on this show, I asked them, "How do you feel about moving towards this? And how did you get here?" And Jamie, I'll start with you. Tell me about your undergrad and how you got to even being accepted to your DSW program. And as a black woman in America, how do you feel about going through this process with all the things that's going on right now in America? So, you know, I, when I graduated with my BA from Cal State Long Beach, I remember a professor asking me, okay, so what now? And when she asked me that, you know, with a degree in communications, I'm like, oh, I'm ready to get a job making a hundred thousand. You know, that was the expectation because you really don't know what to expect. And she said something that has always stuck to me. She said, you know, she was a woman of color. She was, she is a woman of color. And she said, you know, we need more professionals that look like us. You know, when you think about when you go to the doctor's office, how many doc? I, I have never had a black doctor. I've never had a black dentist. You know, how many professionals that I've had that are women or that, you know, resemble me. And so being in the field of mental health, it is really important that we have people that look like us, you know, professionals that we can seek help from. So that really pushed me into getting my license as a marriage and family therapist. And then, you know, I, you know, going into the DSW program that just going back to school, is already a significant commitment because you're you're having to make a balance between family, work, and then now school. And you know, and we're doing it to to build on what people had have done for us. You know, I, I think of everything that my mother, who was an immigrant, did, you know, to se to secure a lifestyle for me or a life for me. And so, you know, I just wanted to build on top of that for my own children. So, you know, you have it's already a very significant commitment to try to go into this kind of program, but then you mix in the pandemic and now mm -hmm. the narrative has changed. And so now it's even more complex, more complicated. And I was just talking to one of our colleagues who had to leave the program early. Her mother actually passed away from the virus and you know, and so and now they've also made the changes to our program, I believe, to where it's now even longer. I'm not sure, but I think they have. 
And so she was asking me, you know, so first, so now, you know, it's like, how do we, you know, things are never going to go back the way that, that they were during the pandemic, you know, so that idea of, oh, I can't wait for things to go back the way that that's not going to happen. So now we are navigating, how do you succeed in something like this during a pandemic? And that kind of creates a innovation space because we know that as life changes, there is space for more solutions. And so, you know, our program is so significant, especially during this time, because we are now going to have to learn how to do things after the pandemic. So I feel like that's what's also motivating me to get through this program because, you know, with the pandemic, I think it's estimated that 40, at least 40 million Americans have lost their jobs, will lose their homes. And so creating, finding a solution space where I can help, you know, these people that have been impacted by the pandemic is such a motivating factor to me at this point. And also, you know, just building on what was built before us. You know, we see this transition from um, treatment first solutions in helping, you know, those that are on house. And now we're seeing this transition into how, you know, housing first solutions. So just building off of what we already know, you know, so that is what's really motivated me to just keep going. And also, I envision myself walking across the stage <laughs> in front of my children, just showing them, you know, you know, that this is the legacy we're leaving behind, you know, that, you know, this platform of, you know, just trying to go beyond what our parents did and creating something for our children so that they can go beyond what we have done, you know? And, and I, feel, I feel like it's, especially, like I say, through the pandemic and us, it will, especially the way, you know, your family is supporting you, especially your husband, even though he's a Cowboys fan. I don't know why y'all love each other, but y'all should just scratch the star and throw it. But the, the support that you receive, the love that your family get, the things that you do to take time to make sure your family still being run as you pursue these things is, is highly commendable. And plus through the pandemic and it's like, okay, we know things like you said are going to change. Things are going to look different. Things are going to be in a new norm as we're going to call them for a later date. But when we come out of it as doctors and being experts within our field and you write the support and the acknowledgement of your family to see because i think about that with my sons like okay i think i'm gonna I'm be the only doctor in my in my in my whole entire family like, mm -hmm. this, this is significant not just to my sons but for my cousins and you know my uncles to, to be proud of me and my aunts to to see you know their right. their their black family member go on to be somebody that mm -hmm. didn't think so. Hopefully, like you, this starts a generational uh, change, and we become successful on the educational side because we got some entrepreneurs in my family, and they always do that thing. But on the educational side of things, I think we just they slow it down a little bit. But I'm going. Mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully, I, I you know I get to pass the torch to one of the cousins and continue to do their things, or like you said, my my two boys, right. my goddaughter, or somebody who see me not out here doing these papers to three thirty or four o'clock in the morning and see us right. all worth it. right. So it's it's interesting. So with that being said, let's let's switch it over to you know your favorite topic in in Donald Trump. Let's see, hold on, did we get Leslie back? Okay, we got her. So I'm hold off on you, Jamie. I'm gonna ask Leslie the same thing. Leslie, thanks for joining us again. I appreciate you. L listen, I asked Jamie, you know, how do you feel as a black woman um, going through this process, getting your doctoral degree? But how did you get here? You know, from undergrad up to this point, and w where we are. And Niani said, "Hey, I don't know if y'all see that across the street, but Niani's watching the stream." He said, "Hello." So. Just tell me a little bit and tell me how you got here and how, as a black woman right now, a young black woman, I might add, because you, you, you're you significantly younger than me. So I'm going to go young black woman right now pursuing her doctoral degree. Let's talk about that a little bit. How I got here. 
Okay, first and foremost, I have to shout out the Lord. I got here by the grace of God. Um, childhood trauma, life experiences. Um, but I would have to say um, I had an awesome undergrad professor named Dr. Kalita Fairfax at Norfolk State University. Um, and she pushed me. She pushed me for the max to think outside of the box and not settle for less. Um, and so at Norfolk State is where I really started to see what my potential could look like um, and how I wanted life to be and what changes I wanted to make. Um, and so when getting my master's at Tulane University, whew, that was tough. That was very, very challenging. And being in the South, I was like, okay, all right. People are really not giving vulnerable populations a safe space to create change within their own environment and their own communities. People are afraid to uh, have tough conversations. Um, I've always been someone that goes against the grain. Um, I'm probably that person that's going to open up the elephant in the room. That's just me. Um, and so um, I think that my uh, undergraduate experience and my experience um, getting my master's really shaped and formed the clinician that I am. But as far as USC, I had no clue that I would be here right now. Um, I knew I wanted to get my doctorate, but I actually quit my job randomly within 48 hours. And I happened to be sitting on my couch one day and the Lord said, you're going to go to school. And I said, oh, that's not what I want to do. And um, I wanted to go back to Tulane and I came across USC's program and the innovative um, aspect and the DSW was just a better choice for me versus uh, the PhD in regard to really shifting um, or changing social norms and being innovative and really making, um, creating change on a macro level. Um, so that's how I got to, to my doctoral program, as well as being a young black woman working on my doctorate. Ooh. Under 30, uh, it's overwhelming. It's, it's, it's very overwhelming. Antoine, Jamie, y'all know how it is. Every week I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, it's, it's challenging, but I have to remember, like, just like historically and just like my roots, and my family background, like, I was built for this. Like, you know, I really was legit built for this. And sometimes um, media, um, our work environment, um, society um, can make us think that we weren't built for this. Um, but I think that it's also not a coincidence that the three of us are in this cohort. And um, I'm excited. I'm excited about the growth that not only will experience, um, but just the changes that we're going to help create alongside, like the community. And I say alongside because so many times people think about changes and they don't include those that it's impacting. And so I'm ready to shake some things up. I, I'm like, I always mess with you. Leslie is, uh, she keeps us on his toes. She asks all the right questions, uh, all at the right exact time. She makes sure we are on point with everything. She's just a ball of energy. and We love Leslie for it. Like, when I met uh, these two young ladies in there, one, I, I wish you could see Jamie's face because she looks like the most innocent person ever created. And then you get her behind closed doors and she a ball of fire. And we discussing all the things that should be changed in the world. And it'd be like, where all that come from out that little person over there? But y'all have kept me on my toes. Y'all got me through a tough patch and I appreciate y'all for it because I wanted to quit this thing. I was ready to, to pack it up. It didn't make sense to me, but without y'all, I don't think I would have got definitely wouldn't have got through that first semester. So I appreciate it. And I I'm definitely looking forward to the end of this semester so we can uh, celebrate accordingly for, for all of us being called candidate of this uh, doctoral degree. Jamie. You there, yes, Jamie? I, I'm sitting here see? nodding my head while oh, you guys are talking. Me, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> can't, we can't see you, Jamie. You can't nod your head. I so. know. <laughs> I'm <just> like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. So what do y'all think about 
Let's, what do y'all think about it? Did anybody watch the debate last night or heard about it, seen it on social media? Well, I know y'all ain't on social media. I know how y'all do. So how, how was a debate for you? How? Let's talk Donald Trump for two minutes. Let's talk Donald he Trump. He gets two minutes. That's it. Let's talk because we got, well, let's talk Joe Biden for three minutes and leave Donald Trump out of it. How did Joe do? Did you watch it? You, you seeing some of the conversation, Jamie? So this is the one debate I did not watch because I was trying to get <laughs> look at our assignment from last right. night. But you know, when you when you think about it and you think at where we are at now in America, and the thing that's so funny about Donald is he keeps saying, "Oh, this is what is going to happen if Biden is the president," but that's happening right now under mm-hmm. you, Donald. So it's like we are already getting a taste of what is to, I think, to come. And so I think when we look at the state of America and we look at how divided we are and like how angry people are, like you really, it's so hard to get a Democrat and Republicans to even, you know, have a discussion, you know, because there's both sides are so, you know, just ramped up of what they want to say. We can't even like, converse anymore we can't discuss we can't do that so it's like when we look towards the future i think when we look at leadership for america i think you have to look at who can bring people together so that people can you can disagree but you should be able to discuss and it's like we are so divided as a nation it's like we can't even come together to discuss and so i think with trump we'll just see more of a division and i think with Biden, you know, even in one of the debates when he was talking about police reform and what it looks like, and he said, you know, we have to, there has to be a conversation. We have to bring people together to discuss how we want it to look. We can't just sit here and say, you know, the, you know, we can't just have the law enforcement say one thing and then us as community say one thing. It's no, we need to come together, be able to discuss the solution together. Whereas with Trump, we know everything is compartmentalized. And so it's like, how do you really work like that? It's not going to work. And you absolutely right. What you got, Leslie? I didn't watch the debate last night. Um, okay. This, this is the one that I, I, I missed saying paper time. Um, but I think that I'm taking a different approach with this uh this um, election and um, I'm just being mindful. I'm being mindful of what I take in and what I put out and also holding myself accountable um, in regards to uh, I want to say the right word in regards to um, my feedback that I give in regards to the debates as well as understanding, just trying to be a little bit more understanding from both parties. I I overanalyze things. You know, I'm a clinical therapist. So from body language to tone to patterns to just, to just everything from childhood, uh, childhood experiences to um, history and, and just everything. And I know Jamie, you were saying like, we're so divided. But this is nothing new, right? Like this is it is nothing is nothing new and until we demand that we want change, um, and come together and kinda unite on some front, um, we're gonna keep getting the same results. Like we're gonna keep getting the same results. So I'm more so like, okay, so what can I do um within my realm and how can I put a spin on it and look at things from a positive perspective um, and not always negative. Because we can get, I can quickly get very negative when I just think about how this election um, can go. But reality is we're a resilient country, right? right. Um, look at us with COVID. Like a lot of stuff is going on, but we're resilient and we're going to overcome whatever happens um, when it comes to when it comes to the election. Um it's a lot. It's and draining. It is. And you're absolutely right. I was having a discussion with uh, one of the guys, one of my friends, and we was 
we were just talking about um we, we were talking about all the things that was going on and how how divided the, the politics is republicans and democrats and you know one of the things that he was like is the republicans are bullies and the democrats are weak like they just we can't find no no happy median to get the things that we all done and that's just to make sure all the american people are happy and you can't make them all happy but we don't have to be this divided but what i'm gonna I'm say in this little two minutes and then we're gonna move on because we got some other stuff to talk about in these last 20 minutes but one thing i'm gonna say now is still make sure you vote in your local election once this is over november the third Make sure when we pop up in, in two years that you vote for your city council, your county council, your county executive, you know, definitely stuff that's going to affect you in your community right now, right now. Not saying that the national election doesn't because we all know it do, it affects over time. But if you want to get a more satisfying or gratifying uh, thing that's going on in your community and putting someone in that, you know, you can call on the phone. You can have your trash removed when you need it. The police officer, you know, the police chief, and you know he was the proper person for you and your community, and you can get a, a connection because you you know that you voted for him, and you can have that, and things can go a little quicker and smoothly. You can't you can't beat that type of a process. But the question is, so, Antoine, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because my friends and I, we've been talking about that, and we're like, you know, we get so hyped for the presidential debate and you forget, I mean, my friends and I, you know, we know to go out for uh, local elections and X, Y, and Z. Um, but the communities, a lot of communities are, are not informed. You know, they don't have the same um, knowledge or, or awareness. And so I think even more is really just showing just like how misguided um, we are as a country and just how ill-informed we are. So it's like, you know, um, if the current leaders aren't providing that education, then, like, how can we step up? Like, right. even my sorority members and I, like, we've been talking, we're like, yo, we really have to really get heavy in the street, like, figure out new approaches to connect with um, community members, especially youth. You know what I mean? That don't know the importance of voting outside of just the presidential election. So you you right. Listen, I have uh, I we've been so deep in this in in this uh, paper. I was looking at uh, theoretical uh, theories last night, theoretical uh, frameworks last night, and I ran across the connected connectivism or something like that. Where it's saying that we, I can't pronounce it, is connectivism. Connectivism. That's what it is, Jamie. Connectivism. I know you over there laughing at me. So, connectivism was a, a, a theoretical framework where it's how we study and how we learn. If we're learning online, are we doing, you know, how we being teached through social media? And I was just, I was thinking, like, wow, man, this is how, this is where we're going to go. And it's being ramped on how we're going to learn and how we're going to study, how we're going to get our information through that particular framework because of how how COVID has hit us so hard and how everybody had to go out and get their politics online and get their news online, get order their food online. Like we have just the connected, the connectivism of the theory part. It's just amazing that if you didn't uh, understand how theories work, like it, it's like, why am I even thinking about this particular theory to put it together because I'm on a higher level of learning now and it's, it's driving me nuts. You can't turn it off. So that's a, that's a good thing, but that can be a dangerous thing. It could be. It because, could. You know, even just like the kids in the school, everything is social media, everything is online. I mean, the kids are just learning shortcuts to X, Y, and Z. Um, don't get me wrong. Social media, um, other avenues, it's, they're pros, but I'm also worried that, um, people will be misinformed as well as also it's kind of like an easier fix versus to do more groundwork and research and education. Like it's just, you can be easily persuaded. I feel like on social media or through an online platform versus um, that human connection piece is important, but you know, but that's also my thing. 
Jamie, you got anything to add? I know you over there nodding your head and we can't see you. So you got anything to add? No, you know yes. I, I'm no, I'm nodding my head in agreement. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Hey, one of our other classmates, Kanikia, just said hello. She said hey to her peeps. And I see my uh, my brothers, my 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 brothers fraternal and my brothers from another mother, Mr. AK Edmund and uh, Orlando Ray Mitchell have joined the party. So I appreciate y'all. Marcel, I know you were here. I hope you're still watching. Always a pleasure that you join me every every Friday night. So I appreciate that. So oh, wait, I just saw a comment. Yeah, yeah. So every now and then we oh. get a comment. So Felicia's producing the show behind the scenes. So she'll flash okay. up. The you got it. So you got to pay attention, Leslie. So wait, wait, wait. So Mr. Edmund, I only caught your last name. You said you learned a lot from social media. Absolutely. You can learn so much from social media. So what I was referencing to is like those with um, little that may lack the um, lack education or uh, other supports or avenues to challenge something else outside of social media. So like even you being on this platform, um, some people may not even get on an informative platform like this. You know what I mean? So like the first chance that they get to see something, they can be easily persuaded and not challenged to think critically or um, research the information that they're getting. But post so, you can definitely get knowledge on social media. Absolutely. You absolutely right. Jamie, how is your social media life? Like I know you and social media are not well vast in friendship, but do you think you can get anything out of it? How's you, how's your learning curve on that going? Um. You know, with this class, I feel like I'm becoming, you know, because usually I use social media as just the news outlets, right? So I would just go back and forth between like news like CNN, Fox, just going back and forth. I like to see what people are saying, stuff like that. But it's something that I started to notice that I enjoy is, you know, that the connection between the audience, the listener, the viewer has direct contact to the person giving out the information, you know, so they can say what they think, they can say what they feel, whether or not the actual person is the person who's reading it, listening to it, looking at the comments, they have access to what we in the community are saying, what we think about it. So there is that some kind of like, um, you know, that connection of us being able to communicate what we think. So I do like that. And I am getting more comfortable with it. But um, I'm trying to look at other sources besides just the news. But um, it, it's still something, you know, it's a process for me to get comfortable with and learn about. It, and what, it's funny about I've, you know, as y'all know, I'm comfortable with how we get this. And I, I didn't and before all the pandemic and everything. I didn't really watch the news. I always, you know, I'm going to catch it on, you know, on a news site or I'm going to go online and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to read the articles I want to know about, try to find out what the, pop the popular information that's going on. But throughout the pan pandemic, I found myself watching the actual news, trying to find out what the different cities and, you know, what the different countries at that point were doing and saying. So I found myself locked into CNN and Fox at times and just the different different platforms to see what's different, even though I'm still getting those things in my email that I can go on the online site because the news cycle is a news cycle. They all plan the same thing. So it didn't really matter where you get it from as long as you get it. And I think it's just more, I don't want to say convenient, but it's like when you are to get an email or something, you know, like, okay, am I going to have to sit down, look at this? Maybe I want to look at it from my laptop, my computer. But when it's something like, you know, um, just somebody access to this, like somebody listening to this, they could just, you know, put it on, listen to it and, you know, whatever. Or if it's some post you read on Instagram and it just kind of it's like quicker to get that, you know, the information, quicker access or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. What's next though, Leslie? After is uh, what's after we get all of our sex workers uh, saved and curriculum and all the police officers taught on training? 
what's next after you? What you think you're gonna move towards after this? Like, you know, I know educationally you probably ain't going nowhere else. It'll probably be some more licenses, or licensures somewhere down the road. But what's next for Leslie? So this is so funny. I just had this conversation um, at work. So I just want to chill. I want to take a break. I want to practice self-care. It's one thing that I have to do. I'm a big Eric Thomas fan. If you love E.T., the hip-hop preacher, like, he is, like, so freaking awesome. And so he has, like, a life coach motivational speaking training um, program. Like, I really want to do that. Okay. Like yeah, I, I, I really, like ET. ET is 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 my motivation when I'm down. Like he he don't be playing with you. I want I I really want to do that. But you know the ultimate goal is always to me be, be my own boss, right? Right. Um, I really am not too fond of traditional social work and traditional practices. Um, so definitely creating a space, having my own agency where um I can operate. I feel at my fullest capacity as well as um have those around me within my practice to kind of just run things um, the way that I think would be innovative and more appropriate. Um, Jamie mentioned earlier, just like um, culturally, just like having others, um, you know, having a black doctor, just having like being able to see more people like you uh, within areas that um, in service areas, right? Or, or helping helping professions, there's a young lady um, from Portsmouth, Virginia, like she's a therapist and she has a trap therapy. So it's kind of like um, therapy with those um, who are culturally uh, competent, but also people that you can relate to, right? Um, and I think that that is like so dope. Um, so the ultimate goal is always to be my own boss and really uh, – Step outside of the box with some, with some things. So. I, I don't, hey, Jamie. I never asked you that question, Jamie. So, to, um, what do you after this? After you then created, um, you saved all the homeless people in Long Beach, and then you across the world. What's what's next after that? Like, where do you see yourself? Why, why did you? I know this program has stretched you a little bit because it stretched all of us. So, what, if if this is it, or did you see see yourself going somewhere else in a different direction? You know, as we've progressed in this program, uh, what besides helping people that are in need, what I find myself also interested in is building equity within my community. You know, I feel like that's really, really important. And it's, you know, currently my neighborhood, it's like we're kind of going, what well, I'm sure neighborhoods are constantly going through gentrification. So we have a whole bunch of, you know, companies, businesses coming into our neighborhoods. And it's like, how does that affect original community members? Like, how does rent look like for us? How does our community continue to be able to afford the communities that we are originally from? So, you know, that has also become something really important to me because, you know, I'm from Long Beach. I'm raising my children from Long Beach. I guarantee at least one of my kids will probably go to Cal State Long Beach and maybe raise their kids in Long Beach. And so it's, you know, it's building the community for my children and for, you know, other kids in the community. It's so that we can continue to grow within our own communities. So I think that's really where I'm starting to see my passion kind of, you know, like gear towards. And and that's, yeah. And listen, doing our paper, we're doing the research for our paper. One of the things about the wealth gap was home ownership and being able to take that. And even if we are successful and most of us are down the road and we're all these doctors and we are here making all this money. One of the things that I learned throughout the research is we don't have uh, equity based things to pass down to our kids. So Exactly. Yes, yeah. That's that like that's, really, that's it really hurts. That to me, that really hurts to know that, you know, because when you look at what is it besides the legacy of like our hard work and our education and what we're trying to build, but it, equity, the dollar bill, that's, you know, that's what we're passing down to our kids. And then when you look at ownership within our black community and you see that that's 
already we are, are a small percent in America, but as far as home ownership, we are like a very, very small percent. And so it's like, you know, we have to do something about this now. And that's what we're doing. We're building that for the next generation to have, you know? And and you absolutely right. Cause my, my, my son's godfather is like, listen, we're going to make sure Avery has every piece of real estate he can. Well, his goal is to uh, show Avery how to buy a house, show him, then show him how to purchase one wherever he lives in college, have him rent it out so he can pay for his college expenses and then sell that house so he can have a down payment for whatever he needs for when he graduates so he can go into his life debt free. Like, I feel like it's super amazing to 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 start thinking that at an early age. And just you even, you know, you discussing like student debt for young black males, like the importance of that, like, you know, how significant, what is the impact for us to be able, if we already don't have equity to build off, what is the impact for us as blacks to be able to build when we have such large debt that we are not even familiar with like we don't know how to navigate through how do we really build with that so i mean it's a lot of work to be done there yeah yeah leslie you look like you was gonna say something go for it oh she was talking about student debt and you know that was just each semester i'm just like all right what's your game plan liz um and so um i've been making smarter choices financially even um, meeting with my financial advisor on a consistent basis um, to make sure that I have all all my ducks in a row um, to invest. And Jamie, you left one cool part out. Um, just like how I feel like your 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 parents helped shape why you're so interested in this. Mm -hmm. You left that out. Like that's so that's so cool. You know. Um, with your your parents um being in um they own like property right yes well, see, yeah you had to remind me <laughs> oh yes. my gosh <laughs> and i'm just Say like yes. i'm sitting here and i'm hearing you talk and i'm just like it's so amazing just how like um how your upbringing or just your influences in life really can impact and shape and form um aspects of you um, right. So, you know, and even just me hearing you like talk, you know, some people don't have that. Some right. people don't have um, someone to push them or even um, have them in a space where they can observe and experience. You get what I'm saying? Right. So when you're, you're speaking and you're talking about just like the, the level, the intensity of need um, and why it's, why it's beneficial you didn't get that overnight. You get what I'm saying? Like, right. hands down, I know that there were some things or some conversations that you've seen, like, with your parents within the community and just how they manage their property and, you know, X, Y, and Z and, and finances. Um, so that just made me just think, like, even more, why we have to push ourselves, we have to challenge ourselves and also, like, really be self-aware and have real-life conversations. Like, when it comes to finances, like, sometimes we think we're good, but we're really not. And mm -hmm. just how, like, we can hold ourselves accountable and, and pay it forward. Um, right. Because I just, that, that parent aspect is really stuck to me. And just, like, your passion and drive. But how can other people be more passionate about it and be more knowledgeable, you know, even if they didn't have, like, that, that, foot, that initial footprint by a parental figure? Right. And that, yeah. that you absolutely right. Cause I would say my mom, when it came to home ownership, she was just like, I don't want a house because I don't want to take out the trash. Like, so she was like, I'm gonna be a runner. So now I feel like that's I learned, I guess that's what we do. We move to apartment to apartment instead of being able to build and and being able to find home ownership and equity. So kudos to dad on that one, Jamie. We appreciate dad and mom for those. Yeah, tell yeah. him said thank you, but so we're gonna be looking at you and knocking on your door when you building all this this wealth to figure out some more. We're gonna lean on you a little bit. But ladies, it is uh five minutes till I usually take the last five minutes to go ahead and go on a quick rant, but y'all stay there, don't go off. 
Just stay with me. Felicia going to mute you in the background. Thank you for joining me tonight. I know I asked y'all last minute, and y'all always there for me when I need you. And I appreciate y'all. Thanks for I had a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And we thank you. I'm waving. I'm, I'm waving to you, even though you guys can't see. Okay, well, we waving back, Jamie. We waving. And I'm making all the facial expressions I make when we do Google Duo. Okay, all right. Well, next time we're gonna have you on here so they can see these expressions. All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks again. I'll see y'all later. Hold it, but Jamie and uh, Leslie, don't don't go off yet. We'll talk to y'all after we finish the show. Okay. All right, here we go. We got the last five minutes. You know how we do. We get this last five minute ran in just to talk about some things. And the most important thing that's coming up is it's early voting. Some early voting across the country has already started. And if you have voted already, thank you so much for doing your civic duty and participating in this uh, election. No matter who you voted for, participating in the process is how you get your voice out because you can have all the conversation in the world. I don't really like to hear people to say I don't participate in the process, but they got all these things to say. So you're not doing anything to try to change it. Is it perfect? No. It may. Is it going to be perfect anytime soon? No. But if you're not able to reach out and put your ballot in and check those names out and say, hey, I want to go to the meetings and write the uh, senator or write the delegates and express your your power to give them influence because they work for you. I say that again, politicians work for you. Somebody asked me a couple months back or, or they expressed to me if I ever became a big politician that, that, that I would be corrupt or evil because I'm going to have to take money from some of the big donors. And I said, if all my people got together and they gave me $100 of the Jordan money or $100 of the TV money and they all came together and all million of y'all put into my campaign, who do I work for? I work for you. I'm going to always work for you because that's what we have to do. And you have to hold your politicians accountable. You have to hold your elected officials accountable. And how you do that is pen and paper. You go to the meetings, you vote, you do all the things that we need to do to be able to say, hey, this is our community and we want to change it. So we talked about a lot of things tonight. I, I love having powerful women on this show because I think it's a shift and how especially black women are at the bottom of most things in America and not respected enough. And I always try to highlight the ones that are doing powerful things because most of the time they held up families and they hold us up as we go. So as these ladies still keep generating all this great power and great wealth and great knowledge, we're gonna make sure we express them, especially on my show. I'm gonna make sure we talk to them, make sure they do it. Cause I, I've been raised by a strong woman. I'm being loved by a strong woman and I got strong women in my life. So I am here on Friday with three minutes left. I need you to go to my page on my YouTube side, Antoine C. Brown, and make sure you uh, hit the like button. Let's get some likes up there. Share this on your page. If you got it, make sure you share this every Friday. Me and, me and uh, the, the beautiful producer is going to start putting some more stuff out so we can get this thing up and running. But early voting, make sure you vote. No more debates. We, it's all about telling your friend, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend to tell a friend so we can get out and uh, accomplish our goal. Whatever goal that is, if you get your, your guy reelected or get the guy to, to be elected, either one. But I need you to participate in how this thing goes. It's been a beautiful show, ladies and gentlemen, as we always do. Make sure y'all be safe. Please wear your mask six feet apart whatever that looks like in these stores. Enjoy yourself. We love you. And we see you next Friday.